morning. Thanks for tuning into our worship service. When was it the last time that you did something kind of unsuspected, unexpected, just in order to meet Jesus, to help another person? When was it the last time that you were climbing a tree or you you went into the deep into the water, dived just to retrieve something you had lost? In our Bible story this morning, we have someone who did something rather unexpected to his family and probably his neighborhood. He climbed a tree. He did something because he was desperate to see Jesus. How desperate are you to see Jesus in the other person, in your neighborhood? How desperate are you to find Christ in the other person and to rekindle a love to the other person? How desperate are we in the first place? Or are we hyper content the way we live? Now, Pastor Dave will ask us a couple of questions to that regard. So, let us pray. Let us pray that we become desperate people. People who are a little bit discontent. Not unhappy, but discontent how our neighbors are experiencing us or perhaps Christ in us. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for Christ in us and through us. We give you thanks that we have a purpose and that our purpose is to be in love with you and one another so that the world will see that there is a God of love, a God of unity. And so help us to make unity the oneness of the body, the seeking of one another, one of our core values in life. Father, help us to be a little bit discontent the way we live. Steer in us a spirit of desperation to meet you and to meet your salvation in the other person. Father, we give you thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ, for the Holy Spirit guiding us in everything Jesus taught us. And so I ask that you will stir a hunger in us, not just to learn more about you, but to learn more from you and with you, with one another and for one another. So we give you thanks for the many blessings we have. And I ask, Father, that you will help us to become a blessing to others, not just with regard to money, but with regard to love, with, with a spirit of reconciliation and forgiveness, with a spirit of reaching out across the fences and the borders and the streets, the neighborhoods, nationalities and language, that nothing divides us, but everything unites us because we are in love, not just with you, but also with our neighbor. So bless us with an almost unquenchable love for one another so that the world will know that we are your disciples. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.
Good, good, uh, okay. good morning, Church of God family. My name is Simon Sharp. Welcome to the service. I hope you are all well. I look forward to seeing you and all again soon. God bless you. Thank you so much, Dennis, for your introduction and welcome. Also, thank you, Pastor Manfred, for your leading us into the service this morning. I so appreciate your loving heart and the moments that we've had to connect. As I was preparing the worship music this week from Luke 19, 1 to 9, one of the questions is, how has Christ changed you? And that immediately took me back to one of the most painful moments in my life. I think one of the best things about the passage of time and getting older is that it allows us perspective to look back and reflect on how God has truly been involved in every part of our lives and does not want us to suffer any hurt. As painful as that time was, I'm grateful that God intervened during my darkest moments of pain. On that day, 19 years ago, I pleaded to God for peace and a sign that things were going to be okay. You see, I was on my way to sign divorce papers and did not want to do this. As I continued to drive, I was listening to the radio and the song Turn, Turn, Turn by the Birds began to play. As you may know, the majority of the lyrics for this song come from the third chapter of Ecclesiastes 1 to 8. I heard the words, to everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season, turn, turn, turn. And a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to death. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to reap, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to laugh, a time to weep. Well, as some of you who know me well might say, I carry my heart on my sleeve, and the tears immediately began to flow. But they were tears of relief. I knew that God was speaking to me and that things would be okay, and the many months of hurt and pain began to subside. I felt like God just embraced me and said, you are going to be okay, and I've got you. God has many times intervened in my life through song. I can't explain it, but he knows each of us intimately, and if we allow ourselves to reach out to him in our own way through prayer, he will answer us. The answer may not be what we're looking for, but he knows our hearts and what we need, so I am grateful for that moment in time that changed my life. And as hard as these moments are to talk about openly, I feel that God wants us all to share our hurts and to let others know that it's okay to be vulnerable and broken, and that people need to see that. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your loving heart. Help us this morning, Lord, to embrace your message through music and words. You are the life giver and the hope that the world needs right now. As we worship this morning, help us to calm our thoughts and direct us towards a peace and understanding that only comes from you. Help us, Lord, to leave the distractions and worries in our daily lives behind. And as we sing together from our homes, unite us as one body committed to your message of hope, peace, and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This week, I've invited my father-in-law, Ed Turner, to read the passage about Zacchaeus and how his life was never the same after his encounter with Jesus. How does Jesus continue to change you in your daily life? This morning's worship songs talk about what God means to us and how this relationship impacts our daily lives. In the song Promise Keeper, it says, With everything I've seen, how could I not believe you are the promise keeper? Your word will never fail. My heart can trust you, Jesus. I won't be overwhelmed. The song Word of God Speak says, To be still and know that you're in this place. Please let me stay and rest in your holiness. I like that. And finally, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. So let go my soul and trust in him. God bless you. Good morning. 
I'm Ed Turner, and I appreciate the opportunity this morning to read a rather unique story from the life of Jesus, Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief collector, tax collector and was wealthy. He went to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be with the guest of a sinner? But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here am I. Now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. May we uh, receive this word and not be forgetful of the words of doers of it. Thank you. Your vows a covenant unbroken You've made it known through history Your love will never be unfaithful Never walk out on me Never walk out on me I have no reason to doubt you you have been, you'll always be. And though the future's still unfolding with everything I've seen, how could I not believe? You are a promise keeper, your word will never fail. My heart can trust you, Jesus. I won't be overwhelmed My eyes are gonna see Miracles and victories You are a promise keeper And your word will never fail You will return all that's been stolen There's nothing that you can't redeem And though the story's still unfolding With everything I've seen How could I not believe You are, you are a promise keeper Your word will never fail Trust you, Jesus, I won't be overwhelmed. My eyes are gonna see miracles and victories. You are a promise keeper, and your word will never fail. I know your word will never fail. I'll see your goodness in the land of the living. I'll see your goodness right here, right now. You know the ending before the beginning. I know that you have worked all things out. I know I'll see your goodness in the land of the living. 
I'll see your goodness right here, right now. I will, cause you know the ending before the beginning. And I know that you have worked all things out. you God for the beginning I trust you worked it all out that you have worked all things out I'm finding myself at a loss for words And the funny thing is It's okay The last thing I need Is to be heard But to hear What you would say Word of God speak Would you pour down like rain Washing my eyes to see Your majesty To be still and know That you're in this place Please let me stay and rest In your holiness Word of God speak Finding myself in the midst of you, beyond the music, beyond the noise. All that I need is to be with you and in the quiet, hear your voice, word of God speak. Would you pour down like rain Washing my eyes to see Your majesty To be still and know That you're in this place Please let me stay and rest In your holiness Word of God speak Would you pour down like rain Washing my eyes to see Your majesty To be still and know That you're in this place Please let me stay and rest In your holiness I'm finding myself At a loss for words Grander earth 
has quaked before Moved by the sound of his voice And seas that are shaken and stirred Can be calmed and broken from my regard And through it all, through it all My eyes are on you And through it all, through it all it is well And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you, and it is well with me. And far be it from me to not believe. Even when my eyes can't see And this mountain that's in front of me Will be thrown into the midst of the sea And through it all, through it all My eyes are on you And through it all, through it all it is well And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you, and it is well, it is well. So let go, my soul, and trust in him, the waves and wind still know his name. So let go, my soul, and trust in Him. The waves and wind still know His name. So let go, my soul, and trust in Him. The waves and wind still know His name. The waves and wind still know his name. It is well with my soul. It is well. Well
And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And through it all, through it all, it is well. And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And it is well. Hi friends, uh, good to see you today. I wish I could say I could see you, but I can't. But uh, it's good that you're with us and that we are together today for this time of worship as well as uh, just listening to what God is saying to us in the Gospel of Luke. And so hopefully this time will be a good time of you being able to learn a little bit more about Jesus and a little bit more about his life and what he has taught us. This week has been a pretty full week. Uh, we started out with Monday um, in having a celebration of life for Reverend Bob Hazen. And I just wanted to acknowledge um, all of you who uh, wish you could have been more a part of that type of service. It was such a beautiful service to be able to hear the words of how Bob ministered to people's lives. And it was great to be able to minister with, uh, with my former colleagues um, at the Church of God, uh, Pastor Brian Crucial, as well as John Mize, and just to be able to be together with them and ministering in this way. Uh, a true tribute to uh, Bob's legacy and his legacy, not only in cameras, but a legacy, legacy throughout um, throughout the, the region of people that were able to speak and able to uh, share in the ministry of music. And so while it was a different funeral than I've ever led before, I don't know if I've ever led a funeral that small, um, but, uh, but it was a beautiful celebration and I'm sure that you were able to watch it on our YouTube channel. If you've missed it, it's still up there if you'd like to take it. And, and just as a side note, um, I've been in contact with um, Pat Reverend Hazen's former church in uh, Lansing, Michigan, Penway Church of God, and have been dialoguing back and forth a little bit with their, uh, their pastors as well as one of their parishioners who, uh, who knew Bob and, and, and uh, sat under his ministry. And here's something that they told me that on Tuesday morning, they decided to show it to their seniors that are in their church just so that they could watch the whole service. And they watched its entirety, a whole hour and a half of service they sat there and watched. And then they had a lunch and after. I think restrictions are a lot easier or a lot less strict in, um, in Michigan. And so they went, uh, they made their way downstairs. And as they, as they made their way downstairs, they have a church bell and they rang that church bell 17 times one year for each, um, uh, for each of the 17 years that, uh, that Bob was with them as their pastor. And so what a wonderful tribute, not only of our, uh, our, our interaction with Bob, but also that he has this legacy that is celebrated years and years past before he came to Canada and before any of us knew him. And so I just hope for us that that is something that we aspire to, is that we will be people who are not just retiring from our faith or retiring from doing God's ministry, but that we continue to being invested in people that are younger than us, people that are younger than us physically and in age, but people who are younger than us spiritually, and that we are leading others and we are using what God has given us to be able to speak into the lives of other people. So I just wanted to recap that and, uh, and just to thank you as your transitional pastor for the opportunity to be able to lead that service and to be able to pay tribute to uh, one of the most special people in my life, um, which would have been uh, Bob Hazen as he mentored me throughout the years that I was with you. And even when I left, I would come back and spend some time with Bob and just uh, hear his wisdom and give uh, as he would give me insight into uh, what it means to be a pastor and, um, and advice in some of the things I'm dealing with. Just wanted to uh, shift us now into a focus on our scripture this morning um, and uh, just, to, just to pause and to listen to what God's word is saying to us and how he 
uh, speaks to us through the story this morning of Zacchaeus, the tax collector, and how that applies into our lives and what Jesus is saying to each and every one of us through this story. Let's have a word of prayer together as we shift into that time of scripture reading and listening and teaching. God, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have to be able to be a part of this service in this way. And God, I thank you that even though we are scattered into our homes and even scattered into a different city, I live in a different city than my church right now. And God, I thank you that even though we are miles and miles apart, Lord, that we are gathered together as your body, worshiping you and listening to your words spoken to us. And I just pray, God, that you would uh, open our ears and our minds and our hearts to be able to hear your word for us today. I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. So just love this passage because it is so rich of being able to celebrate and see life change in fast forward. <laughs> Um, just to, to recap, last week we talked about the, the young rich man, who uh, the rich young ruler, who came to Jesus and said, hey, how do I get salvation? And Jesus told him, well, do all the things, follow the commandments. Well, I did that. And Jesus said, sell all you have and give to the poor. That was how we left off last week and how the rich man walked away. And because he just wasn't able to see how Jesus can transform his life and how he needs to put his faith in God as opposed to his faith in his finances. And so that was the challenge for us last week. And this week, we've skipped, a, we've skipped ahead a little bit because G, there was the, the, the um, if you read on in chapter 18, where we left off last time, we just talked about the... Um, the rich young ruler, but then there was also Jesus predict his, predicted his death a third time. So he's done it once, not once, but twice, but three times. Um, and then we also had the blind beggar who receives his sight from Jesus and Jesus' presence. And so those are powerful stories. Those are powerful images that we could focus on, but I've decided to skip ahead a little bit. And we're, we're skipping ahead to chapter 19 in the first 10 verses to be able to talk about Zacchaeus, the tax collector. And I call him a short tree climbing tax collector because I think it's important to recognize that um, uh, that with Zacchaeus, uh, he was extremely short uh, and he was also a tax collector. And I'll, I'll talk about why that's significant um, a little bit later on in the service. But I just wanted, uh, this story kind of reminds me, Zacchaeus reminds me of a friend I had in elementary school. His name was Brandel and Brandel was smaller than everybody else. I, I haven't seen him for decades now. I think since high school. But when I was in elementary school, Brandel was one of the smallest kids in class. And he was extremely light. He was very thin. And it was like his bones were hollow because he was just so light. And every once in a while, Brandel would say, hey guys, just pick me up and throw me. And so we would pick him up and we would just throw him in the air. And he was like a cat. He always landed on his feet. Um, and so he was great at climbing trees because even though there weren't any low-lying branches that he could reach, we could throw him up to a branch and he could grab it. He was very athletic and very strong, but very light. And he would be able to grab that branch and then he could climb up the tree. And it was just absolutely incredible. He was just a fun friend to have around. Um, and uh, and he was just it was just really great to be able to do it. We could probably throw him over a fence so that he could you know take apples from somebody's tree if we really wanted to. We never did that, but you know that could be handy if we were hungry and passing a, um, a an apple tree if it was in a backyard. But I wouldn't recommend that, by the way. But anyway, uh, Brandel was uh, reminds me of Zacchaeus the tax collector because he was small and he could climb trees. So that's the connection there. But let's look at the passage of scripture here, uh, beginning at verse one in chapter 19. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see Jesus, um, who Jesus was, because, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. So not that it really matters, but Zacchaeus was likely uh, less than five feet tall. So here's a grown man, less than five feet tall. Now I'm not a tall person, I'm about 
average, maybe even a little bit low average, I don't know. Um, but he was way shorter than I was. And so here is a very small man, and he was also not just a tax collector, but a chief tax collector. So here you have, um, you got to understand that in that time, the Jewish people were ruled by the Romans. And so they were basically um, colonized by the Romans. And so the Romans invaded uh, Israel. And so all of the Jews were under that Roman rule. And it was a military, militaristic type rule. And what happened was the Romans, they wanted, they wanted a lot of wealth and they wanted a lot of money. And so what they did is they taxed the people heavily and there was a burden of tax. And it was a horrible, horrible burden of tax. And what they did was they would hire um, Jewish people to be able to tax, to collect the taxes from their own people. And so here, Zacchaeus was not only doing that, but he was like in charge of all the other Jewish guys who then collected taxes from the people. And so, so Zacchaeus was the one who took the money from the tax collectors and handed it over to the Roman government. And so this guy was despised. This guy was small. And it was probably a good thing he was small because he could like blend into a crowd and he could probably get away pretty easily. But Zacchaeus was this guy who was despised and had absolutely, he probably was despised by his family, he was despised by his people, and he was also despised by the Romans because they would never see a Jewish person as anyone of value. And so Zacchaeus was so alone and probably so ashamed at all of the things that he was um, told and all the things that he had been called. And so we have to understand that Zacchaeus had this desperation to see Jesus. He had a desperation to see Jesus. And he wanted so bad to have a relationship with Jesus. And, and the desperation we see is not only in the fact that he wanted to see Jesus and he was desperate, but he was desperate enough to humble himself to climb a tree. I don't know about you, but I don't see a lot of grown men climbing trees, unless it's kind of a sport thing or if they're with a bunch of other guys who dare them to climb the tree. But somebody who's alone, like I don't know if I've ever been alone in a park and decided, oh, I'm just going to climb this tree for fun. Or I'm just going to try to climb this tree to get a better view. Well, maybe I would. I don't know. It depends on the view, right? But for Zacchaeus, he was so desperate that he was willing to humiliate himself and to not just blend in the crowd, but stand above the crowd and be possibly seen by others as he's climbing this tree and making a fool of himself and making himself look ridiculous and standing out from the crowd, but he just was desperate to see Jesus. So let's look at what happens. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must come to your house today. So he came down and at once welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he, he has gone to be with a guest of a sinner. So here we see once again how hated Zacchaeus was. That he was, he was a child of Abraham. <laughs> that he was... He was one of the chosen Israelites, and yet he was despised by his people and labeled as a sinner. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't go around calling people, oh, you're a sinner, oh, you're a sinner, oh, that's a sinner, right? I don't do that. You don't do that but to people you respect or people that you like. But here, Zacchaeus had that label that he had to carry, and he was despised so much by the people. Let's look at verse 8. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord. Now this is already, he's at the house and, and they're reclining for lunch. And Zacchaeus is impacted by Jesus, by his ministry and by the words that he's saying. And Zacchaeus stands up and he says, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of all my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay them back four times the amount. So here, Zacchaeus is admitting that he is corrupt. 
He is admitting that he does. He has never cared about the poor. He's admitting that he has ripped people off, <laughs> that he has cheated people, that he has charged them too much for their taxes. And yet he's saying, now I'm going to take everything I have and half of it goes to the poor. And what I'm going to do with the rest is that if I've ripped anybody off, I'm not only going to double it, but four times the amount of what I've ripped them off. So here's a guy who's calculated in how he's cheated other people. He probably even wrote it down. But you see, now we have not only is Zacchaeus desperate to find and meet Jesus and to build a relationship with Jesus, but he realizes and recognizing that relationship with Jesus requires a sense of responsibility. And we see how Zacchaeus is now willing to change his ways. He's willing to change his behavior. He's willing to change how he sees his life and how he lives his life from that moment forward. And I think that in our lives, we need to recognize that we need to have times where we are desperate for Jesus. And we need to have times where we are willing to change the responsibilities and recognize the responsibility that we have because of the relationship that we're pursuing with Jesus. And that's something we talked about last week, didn't we? We talked about how we want a relationship with Jesus. And as we grow in that relationship, it increases our responsibility of how we act out and how we, how we, how we do uh, um, life and how we act out in life following Jesus. And the more we know Jesus, the more we want to take that responsibility that is put on us as children of God. So Jesus' response, he says, uh, Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house. Because the man, this man too is a son of Abraham, so he's Jewish. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So he's saying that even though Zacchaeus was a son of Abraham, he was Jewish, but he was still lost in his sin. And he recognized that as, as Zacchaeus wanted to desperate, desperately meet Jesus, he wanted to desperately be with Jesus, and how he's willing to, to change, and he has that responsibility that, that but when both of those meet, that Zacchaeus is going to go a different way. And that when that relationship and that responsibility meet together, that life change happens. That instead of going a certain direction, that we, we just go a little bit of a different direction within our lives. And so I want us to ponder these questions together. That have you found that, that lately, or have you found in your life, can you remember a time, or maybe that time is now, where you're desperate for Jesus? Where you're desperate for a change to happen in your life. Where you're desperate for, for something, to, something to give, something to, to transform you. And what are you willing to do in that desperation to meet Jesus in a more powerful way? For some of us, that might mean climbing a tree. <laughs> I doubt it. But for other, others of us, it might be taking the time to spend with Jesus. And that might be through reading scripture on a daily basis. It might mean, uh, might mean um, taking time to pray to Jesus. It might, be, it might be just being aware of his presence in your life in a more tangible way. Because the thing is, God wants us, Jesus wants us to be desperate to meet him to be desperate to have a relationship with him. And it's not that it's not that we um, it's not that we are are totally emptied of ourselves, but we want to pursue that relationship. And and to ask God, God help me to be help me to be desperate for you. Not because of the emptiness in my life, but because I just want to know more of you, God. And I want you to know more of me. And I want more of your presence in my life. 
Are you desperate for Jesus? And in that desperation, and as that relationship grows, is, is there a sense of, of willingness that you want to change within your life? I think some of us are so caught up in living our lives for ourselves that we don't ask God, God, what do you want for my life? What do you want for my life? That as I follow you and as I get closer to you, what does that mean? What change in my life are you requiring of me? And what is the next step for me to take in that requirement? So are you willing to change? That's how our relationship with Jesus grows, is our willingness to change, our willingness to have him more of a part of our lives. But it's not just so that he can make us feel better. But there's, there's something that he wants us to do. There's something that he wants to do through us. And then finally, are we like Zacchaeus later in this story? That not only do we sense that responsibility, but we're willing to go a different way. And that means that we're not just changing our responsibility or changing what we do for a short time, but it's changing who we are. <laughs> it's changing who we, what we do long term. Does that make sense? And there's that long faithfulness and that long-term obedience that God wants us to have within our lives. That not only is it a one-off where, oh yeah, I met Jesus and he changed my life a little bit and I changed for a while, but you know, this stuff, this stuff is pretty good over here and I think I've got it figured out. That's not what God wants for us. What God wants for us is that we meet Jesus is that we're desperate for Jesus and we build a relationship with Jesus and then we change our ways, but then we, just, we don't just change our ways for a little time, but we keep growing and we keep developing, we keep learning and we keep, we keep, we keep building up on what God has given us. And as, we're, as I've reflected on, on this passage of Scripture, as I've reflected on, on how I see discipleship and how we become fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ, that we don't just become fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ for a time, but for all of our time. And that, that as we grow, that we need to keep growing and we can need to keep challenging ourselves and we need to keep moving forward. And it's not that we continue to have these polished and wonderful accomplishments within our lives. It's not about the accomplishments. It's about the faithfulness, isn't it? See, as we reflect on, on the life of someone like Reverend Hazen, um, his life was not spent looking for a whole bunch of recognition and a prominence and prestige. But his life was a long-term obedience of faithful relationships that he built with people. And I think that that's a great example of someone who seeks to be like Jesus, right? And somebody who wants to be committed to discipleship. And I think that the question for us too is that, you know, as God has invested in you and others have invested in you, how are you investing in others? Because I think we need to be people who invest in other people. Are you investing in, in your spouse? Are you investing in your children? Are you investing in your neighbors? Are you investing in, in, uh, in your, your church ministry? Are you investing in other types of ministries throughout the community? Because God wants us to be participants in his kingdom and he wants to do things through us as he does things uh, in us. So hopefully something in there was challenging for you today and uh, helped you to understand how the Gospel of Luke and how the ministry of Jesus speaks into our lives. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for the words of your son, for how he gave us the example and how even the, even the short tree climbing tax collector is someone who can be a tremendous example to us. 
And God, I thank you that no matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, that you give us your grace, your peace, your love, and and your chance for us to be saved. And so God, help us to be people who are desperate for you. God, who are willing to allow you to work in us, to change us. And God, that that change would help us to have a long-term change of following you and walking towards you in our lives. Thank you, God. Help us to do this as individuals, as families, and as a church. I pray this in your name. And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you turn to him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for joining us. I hope you have a great week. Uh, We'll see you again next week.